for singing with me. I bet y'all didn't see that one coming. Um, it's so funny to me. Uh, in my former life, I was a singer. And it's not something that I use a lot. But what I have found is there's nothing like obedience. And when the Lord says, hey, you better sing, that's when I sing. <laughs> so that's what he said. And you better believe I am not disobeying that word. So I'm just grateful for the Lord's presence today. Today, we are going to talk about some of my favorite characters in the Bible, and that is Ruth and Naomi. You all may be super familiar with this story, and some of you may have never heard it before. So I'm kind of, before we read our text, I'm going to give you a background to what's happening. So Ruth and Naomi, it happens in the Old Testament. And Naomi was a really respected woman in Bethlehem. There was a famine that happened in Bethlehem, though. And so her husband and her two sons had to move away to find some food. And isn't that how it is so often? Something happens right where we are, and so we're thrust into a new situation, into a new circumstance, whether we asked for it or whether we didn't. God has a way of going like, Get on out of that comfort zone and go somewhere else. So that's what they had to do. And I'm sure Naomi is expecting that she's going to go and they're going to find food and everything's going to be awesome. But in fact, what happens is her husband dies. Now, her sons had gotten married at this time and they married people from the land that they went to. But then her sons died. So here she is, Naomi and two daughter-in-laws from a foreign land. Now she realizes, if you know anything about widows back in the day, they didn't have like inheritance, they didn't really have any money. So she needs to go back to her land and hopefully the people, her people, her tribe will provide for her. So she goes back, back to Bethlehem but instead of all the blessings she had when she left, now she's completely empty-handed. Now she's completely broken. So everybody gets really excited. The whole town stirred, and everyone's like, oh, my gosh, Naomi's coming back. Naomi's coming back. And there's, they're probably ready to celebrate. But Naomi says, don't celebrate this. In fact, don't even, don't get excited that I'm here. Don't even call me Naomi because the name Naomi means pleasantness. And she said, that's not my name anymore. Don't call me that because my life is not pleasant. In fact, my life is very bitter. Call me Mara, which means bitter. And I was struck by this because today, uh, the, the, the word of tonight is called radiant I love that. Don't y'all love that word? It makes me think of, when I think of radiant, I think of my sister-in-law, Victoria, who is pregnant. And so she's radiant. I mean, you know, my family is always radiant, but there's something about when a woman is pregnant. It's just, they have this extra level of beauty and expectation. So that's what I think of. Well, she's exactly the opposite. She's had her children. Her children have passed away. She has, she's thinking, I'm done for. I'm going to be a poor widow for the rest of my life. I'm the opposite of radiant. Now, the Bible says, and this is our scripture tonight, it says in Psalms 35, 4, those who look to him, the Lord, those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. But it's like, wait, okay, so Naomi believed in God, and the Bible says if you look to him, your, your face will be radiant. But here she is saying, no, I am bitter. Don't even call me by my name. What? I mean, these things are opposites. It seems like maybe God lied to somebody. Wouldn't, isn't that how you'd feel if you were Naomi? And you're coming home and you're coming home empty-handed? Well, I want to turn. I want to have you guys turn if you have your if you have your Bible or cell phone Bible, which, as I said, I'll be reading from today. We're going to find ourselves in Ruth chapter 2. We're going to start in uh, 
verse 1. Now, if you haven't had your Bible study today, that's okay. I'm going to read 12 entire verses of the Bible so you can get caught up with your Bible reading for the day. All right, so hang on in there and let's go. Let's read together. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So I want to point out something to you. When Ruth, who was with Naomi, when she decided to go glean, This was probably the only work she could find. This was probably the only thing that she knew how to do. They didn't have their own field. They didn't have their own. They had land, but it hadn't been worked. It had been 10 years. So she's probably thinking, I got to do something right about now to provide for me and my uh, my mother-in-law, who is too depressed to do anything else. So that's where she finds herself. And she doesn't say, I'm going to go to Boaz's field. She's just going to any field. She is literally just doing whatever she can do. And it happened that she ended up in Boaz's field. So let's go to verse 4. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you're thirsty, you go get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. So here's, let me set this up for you. Here's what's happening. Again, it seems coincidental. It seems like, okay, well, I'm just going to do what I am going to do. But it's not because Ruth has found herself in a precarious situation with no job, no food, no way forward, And little by little, we're seeing in the story that she has favor. She has favor everywhere that she is going. So when I was thinking about you all, and this is is where, you know, I found myself. And as I'm praying for you all, I said, Lord, okay, so where are these women? Like, what's going on with them? Speak to me, Lord. And he kept saying to me, in the in-between, I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe. (laughs) Have you ever had that moment where God says something and you're like, I don't know if that's it. Let me just keep, (laughs) let me keep praying until I'm sure. And then the next day, God, I just thank you for these women. Where are they? The in-between. So I'm not going to make a generalization that every single person is in a waiting season or a wilderness season or in between where you want to be and where you're going I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is the majority of you more than likely find yourselves in the in-between. So what does that mean? It's, it's like you're not who you used to be, but you're not who you're going to be, right? Your day-to-day isn't what it used to be, but it's not what you're hoping for. 
you are, um, you know, you, maybe you used to like what you did, but now you're still doing it all these years later, and now it's like, oh my goodness, can we please do something else? What is next? Or even the in-between can be a spiritual thing where you find yourself like somewhat comfortable in your relationship with the Lord, but you can look back in your past and you can remember these moments where you were just so desperately in love with Jesus. And now you're like, I mean, okay, he's okay, he's good. I mean, I'm just kind of praying every once in a while. I read my U version verse of the day, and that's pretty much all I can do right now. So you're in between. You're 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 not as on fire as you used to be, but you're hoping certainly to catch that fire again. It's the in-between. And if you're sitting here and you're looking at me and you're going, well, I don't know if I'm in the in-between or if I'm not. So let me give you some of the emotions or feelings that can come along with this space. Um, it can feel, your life can feel dry. Your emotions can feel dry. You can feel stuck, confused, um, kind of like, which way am I going? What am I supposed to do next? You can feel apathetic, like, I don't even know. I, I give up. I quit. You can feel hopeless, like maybe maybe there's not really anything good on the other side of this or anything better than where I am right now. You can feel like your best days are behind you. You can feel like you're wasting time. You can feel purposeless. Here's one. Uh, here's one for the church. You can be stuck in anxiety and anxiety can speak to you. Anxiety is uncertainty about the future. That's where that feeling of anxiety comes from. And so often when we're in the in between, we're like, I want, I have all these visions and goals and I want so badly to get wherever there is, but I'm here and I'm not sure how this is all gonna, you know, look in the future. So I'm anxious. You're in the in the in between. Sometimes you can feel like you're going backwards instead of forwards. And uh, here's one, especially Especially as you, I feel like, as you get a little older, this one um, happens. Whatever God spoke over you in your life, it feels farther away than it ever has before. Has anyone ever experienced that? Where you get a promise from God or he says, oh, you're going to do this or you're going to be that. Or people will come up to you and they'll encourage you. And, you'll be, and then like a year passes and then another year passes and you're like, Okay, Lord, this is not what you said. The in-between can feel like somebody literally lied to you. And a lot of times that disappointment ends up going to God. Well, God, I don't know if I can fully trust you anymore. Or we say, oh, I trust you, Lord, I surrender. But really we're like, look, I got to make some plans because he's not doing what he said he was going to do. We got to get this ball moving. Look, I know, I know who I'm in the room with, okay? I know how it is as a woman. We are the queens of making some plans. If things are not going our way, we're making about a million other plans. We have the worst case scenarios, all the possibilities, how things could happen. If we don't write it out, we still, it's going in our mind all the time. If this doesn't happen, here's the other things I can do. If that doesn't happen, here's how this could work. I mean, come on, we analyze all the time. It's the in-between. It's the uncertainty of the in-between. And whether you find yourself there uh, today or not, one thing that I know is that we don't walk by our feelings. Those are examples of how we feel in the in-between. But the beauty of this walk with Jesus, and this isn't going to sound like beauty, but it is, he is very comfortable in our discomfort. Why is that? We're like, God, get me out of here. Rescue me. Do something. Jesus, you said when I call on your name, you come. Where are you? Like, what's happening? Move me out of this really uncomfortable place, please. And he's just like, love you. <laughs> Wait on me, girl. <laughs> I got you. We're like, are you serious, Jesus? Do you see what I'm going through in my life right now? Oh, 
but he's comfy because not just, let me say this, it's not just because he has a plan, which he does. He's comfortable because he's not on a, a time schedule like we are. He's not like, oh my goodness, I'm 29 now and I'm not married. We might get like that. He is not like that. He is not stressed. He is not, um, he is not worried about what we think needs to happen at what age like we are. God is not bound by time. And God is not a destination God. We are destination people. So we think we gotta, we're, we got to get somewhere. we got to do something. We've got to go. We've got to succeed. We've got to thrive. You know, all of those YOLOs, stuff like that. All of that. We want it. But God wants us. He wants our heart. He wants to be with us in the journey. So where you are right now is as important to the Lord as whatever it is that he has for you next. The area of your life where you feel like absolutely nothing is happening, everything is standing still, and you're so uncomfortable wherever you are, God is fully comfortable because all he wants is you. He has it worked out. He has the plan ready. But let me tell you the truth. His plan is intimacy with you. His plan is not about all the things you can accomplish. It's about partnering with you, having that love relationship with you. And through that, you guys are going to accomplish amazing things together. Let me tell you. And if he promised it to you, it will come to pass. That's the beauty of not living in our feelings, acknowledging them, but saying, you know what, God, in your word, you say that you have more for me. So I have to live according to that truth, not my present truth or what it looks like right now. You know, I'm saying, I'm telling you guys a story, and um, <laughs> let me tell you, I'm very familiar with the in-between. I'm very, very familiar. So um, some of you may know this and some of you may not. I, like I said, I am a former singer. I was in a group with my two sisters called Out of Eden. And we started singing, we started touring when I was about 12 years old. And we had a very long and thank God successful career. Um, after 13 years, we decided, like, we're adults now, like, good enough. <laughs> like, you know, to this day, people are like, why'd you retire? You were, like, still really popular. I'm like, yeah, we just kind of felt like, yeah, okay, <laughs> we're done. If you were in our heads, it would make more sense. But, oh, I got a, someone's hair that's not mine. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> um, so we retired, and I thought it was a really good idea. But then I get home, some time passes, and I realize, like, wait, what am I supposed to do with my life? Because for 13 years, like my entire growing up, this is all I've known. So now what do I do? And then, of course, everyone knows you as a singer, so they're always asking you about that. And I knew th I didn't want to go back to that, but I didn't have, like, a plan. So I did the only other thing I knew how to do, which was party. <laughs> yeah, I know, those two things don't really go together. Um, Christian music, partying, okay, but that was me. That was just all, it's like, I was confused. I had no idea, so I just was like, well, I'm good at uh, promoting parties, so I'll do that. So I started throwing, like, all the parties, <laughs> just all of them. And the more I did that, the less my relationship with God thrived to the point where I just, I felt like I was suffocated. There, there was no life in my life anymore. I just, I was so lost. And I'm like, man, I've been in ministry my whole life, and here I am. Like, I am so lost and depressed and tired, and it, it, was, it was awful. And thank God for his goodness. He rescued me out of that lifestyle, and he brought me back to himself, and he's so good. He's so faithful to have done that. But being my get it done Danielle, I was like, okay, so maybe this means I need to be back in the ministry, like immediately, like stop partying, get close to God, okay, so I'm supposed to go back on the stage, right? 
that's, you know, because that was all I knew. That's what I was thinking. So then this huge tour called, uh, calls me like a women's tour. And they're like, hey, uh, we heard you like to preach and we want to have you. Um, we're going we're gonna to be doing like arenas and we're going to be, you'll be speaking in front of 10, 20,000 per night. Do you want to do this? <laughs> do I want to do this? Of course. Um, you know, yeah. So uh, that's what I did. I jumped onto the, back onto the road, back into the familiar. And instead of singing, now I was speaking. And I thought, man, God, this is it. Like, you did that quick. <laughs> you got me, like, uh, in the club, in the prayer room, on tour. Like, it was, woo, very fast. And what happened was when I got out there doing what I really thought I was meant to do, I was like, okay, I am sitting here in front of people and I'm preaching, but why isn't, this isn't working for me. It's not fulfilling me. And what I didn't realize is that I had thought things were supposed to happen so quickly that I didn't let God instill character in me. I didn't have what I needed in depth to really be able to sustain the position that God gave me. So instead of, of ministering to people and leading them to Jesus, I led, I kid you not, I led the people on tour with me to the club. And it was one of those moments where you're like, how did I get here? Like, I'm supposed to be sharing the love of Jesus, and we're taking shots after? Like, this is not, these two things do not go together. And look, this isn't some, like, religious, if you drink, you're going to hell message. It's not. What it is is that I know that I am called to show people who Jesus Christ is. And instead, what I was doing was I was living a life that was far below what God had called me to. And I was stuck there. I was in bondage, and I couldn't break out. So I, was, I remember like it was yesterday, I sat in my hotel room and I was crying. This was after partying all night. I said, Jesus, how did I get here? How did I get here? Help me, help me, I am a mess, help me. And the Lord said to me, do you want to be a famous worldwide speaker? Because if that's what you want, I'll do it for you. And I'm sitting here, you know, when the Lord's speaking, your heart is racing and you're like, oh my gosh. And I'm like about to panic because that sounded horrible at the moment. He said, or you can go home to Nashville, Tennessee and make disciples. And I can't really explain. I can't, it's hard for me to even tell that moment in my life without tearing up. Because the goodness of God to rescue me and to deliver me from myself, really, is it just, it still is meaningful to this day because without him I would be nothing. And so I said, God, take me home, take me home. And what I didn't know is that that was going to start 10 years in the in-between. I did not preach or sing on a stage outside of my local church for 10 years. And while that might seem a little bit extreme, God was changing me from the inside out. I'm not the person that I was 10 years ago. God has done such a deep work in those 10 years, in that in-between, where it may seem like, yeah, that's a, it's a long time, and it's like you think, oh, God, what if something takes 10 years for me? It seems like it would cause like a panic, but what I want to show you is I have a photo here. Wherever my photo is, can you? Oh, there it is. Y'all, look what Jesus did in the in-between. So this is, this is my husband, Gabe. He's videotaping over there. Uh, this is my daughter, Aya, and these are my twin boys, Gabriel and Amaziah. And 
although he's, you know, he's working on me, I'm outside of what I think I should be doing, he's building. He's building legacy. He's building a life for me that I never thought was possible. I never thought I was going to get married. I never thought it was for me. I thought I was too wild. I thought I was too wild to have kids. Surely God would not entrust me with babies, right? Like, what? Like, do you know who I am, Lord? And yet, his plan was absolutely perfect for me. And then in the beginning of 2019, when he released me once again, told me very specifically, it's time to go back. It's time to preach. It's time. And doors started flying open for me. And you know what? The craziest thing is I was ready. I was ready. He had built something in me that can sustain both a family, a relationship with him, and being at the forefront and preaching the gospel. It's amazing. What he did is amazing. And I want to show you that even in the story of Naomi and Ruth, he did the same thing. So it seems like Ruth was just doing whatever she could do and she was just getting by. But in fact, like I shared before, it just happened that she was at Boaz's field, right? Then it says, and just then, Boaz showed up. So you're telling me right when she gets to the right field, then Boaz shows up, and then he just happens to favor her. So he, in verse 8, he gives her a position. In verse 9, he gives her protection and insulation from fear, meaning that not only did she not have to be afraid, but she knew it. So she could gather wheat in peace, in peace of mind. And that's what the Lord wants to do for each of you here. Whatever's going on, as you work, as you wait, as you tarry, whatever it is that you're doing before the Lord, he wants you to know that you know that you know that you don't have to be anxious, that you don't have to be afraid, but that he has a perfect plan and he is building something that's going to turn out in your favor. He gave, Boaz gave her a rest and hydration, so her physical needs were met whenever she needed it. He gave her favor. He gave her recognition. And then every, at every turn, he gave her increased blessing. Every turn. You can read this story for yourself, and every time Boaz speaks to her, she gets favor, she gets blessing, even in the in-between so I shared my story of how I got into the in-between, how I got into the season of what in the world, Lord, am I doing now? I shared how I got there. But for you all, it may be something completely different. More than likely, each of your stories is incredibly unique at how you got to where you are right now. For some people, it may look like a job change, a loss of a job. For some of you, it may look like um, a long season of singleness that you're ready to get on out of. For some of you, it may be that you're booed up, you have a boyfriend, and you're waiting on him to propose, and he's taking too long. Um, that can definitely be a season of in-between. I remember that one. Um, <laughs> I remember that one. No, I was just kidding. For some of you, uh, it may be pregnancy. Pregnancy is one of the most interesting in-betweens because um, we know that, we literally know that something is being built. Um, do we, any mamas in here? Okay. So you know something's being built on the inside, but on the outside, it's like, oh my goodness, this is taking forever. God, can you cook this baby? Let's get it going. And then if you're pregnant, a lot of times, especially if it's your first child, we want to get to the other side because we want to get back to who we used to be. It's almost like, man, when this baby gets out, I'm going to sleep more. When this baby gets out, I, <laughs> yeah. I know. First time moms, that's what you think. I, don't, I can't explain it. We're... We're not as smart the first time around. <laughs> but you think, oh, man, I'm going to get back to work. I'm going I'm to get my life together. We think all these things. But 
in the in between, our bodies are changing completely. Like literally, every cell of your body is different when you have the baby than when you got pregnant. Every single one, and our bodies are telling us something, right? Mamas, you know, your bodies are telling you, hey, you're about to be completely different than you were before. And uh, the good news is at the end, we have this amazing baby and everything is different. And if we're wise, we submit to that difference instead of trying to become who we used to be. So that is a wonderful picture, really, of what I'm talking about about the in-between, because it, we don't always see a belly growing and all this stuff. Sometimes it's things that aren't so obvious and are not so joyful. Um, some other examples, moving can put you in the in-between. Stagnation, meaning no movement for a really long time, when you just kind of live in the same life over and over and over again, and it just feels like is there something else? There's got to be more than this. That's the in-between. On a more serious note, divorce can put you in the in-between. And things like trauma, things that happen to you um, that you would have never chosen for yourself. And grief. Grief is something that thrusts us often into the in-between. And Naomi knew that. She knew that grief. Because like I had shared before, she's coming from being full, and now she's coming back empty. And I know that some of you in here may be dealing with grief in a way that you can't even explain, either because something that happened to you, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a dream or a hope, something you thought was going to happen, and it just didn't happen. These things can be absolutely heartbreaking. There is so much that happens in this world that we can't explain. And I, like most of you, can't fully explain why these things happen. And we get to this point where we develop this mindset that says, well, okay, so God must have allowed that to happen so that his ultimate plan can be fulfilled. We think, oh, okay, so somehow God's sovereign, right? So he must have known it was going to happen, and, and he kind of made it happen so that this is the way that often we begin to think. But I don't believe that because I don't believe it's in the character of God to do bad things to his children that he loves. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I have, I have, you've seen my three beautiful children. There is, there is no way that I would do something bad to them just so that they could learn a lesson. It's not in my character, and I'm not even nearly the parent that God is. Not even close. So our very good father, so what does line up with, with who he is? I believe that things happen in our fallen world, that we, they're outside of our control. They do happen. God doesn't make them happen, but they do happen. And what God does in his goodness and in his grace is he brings redemption. He favors us in those in-between times. He bestows blessing on us in those in-between times, even those times where everybody else is ready to celebrate, and we don't even remember our own name because we can't stand the sorrow that's going on in our own lives. Even then, even then, God is working things out for us. God is a God who builds legacy. He doesn't think for like a short term. He doesn't think uh, right in the moment. We do. He's not only about the moment. He is for the long term. And even in our story, we see that God was busy building a legacy for Ruth and for Naomi. Naomi may have been too depressed to see it at the moment, but God sees for the long term. And he was building something in both of them. So I want to turn my final passage as I close is Ruth 4, 
verses 13 through 17. It says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Redemption. (laughs) When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And some of you all may know, but he's in the direct line, the direct lifeline of Jesus. That's legacy. That's legacy. When I thought about what I was going to talk about today, the, the title of the message was actually, There is More in the In-Between. There is so much that God has for each and every one of you, but one of the greatest things I can tell you tonight is that he has more of himself for you. When we think of more, a lot of times we think of getting to the destination or getting to the other side of hurt, getting to the other side of grief, getting to the other side of stagnation or life that seems like it's just not enough for us. But God says, I am the more. I am the more right now. And when we come to him and when we call on him and we spend time with him, just loving on him, whatever that looks like. For some of you, you know, you just love the word and you just, you know, you want to eat it up. Do it. Do it. Spend that time in the word. For some of you, you love to worship. If you're like me, I always make sure the door is locked when I spend time with the Lord because I do my interpretive dancing. (laughs) Yeah, that's something no one will ever see except Jesus. But whatever it looks like for you, we have to get to a place where no matter what's going on in our lives, we can say, God, it's all about you, and my life kind of stinks right now. But if you come, Lord, and you spend time with me, if I can feel your presence and be surrounded by you, if I can have more of you, then that'll be enough for today. And as we do that, as the presence of God fills our rooms, fills our cars, fills whatever space we make for the Lord, when he comes, I'm telling you, ladies, there is so much more in those moments for us. It's like We forget about all the chaos of the in-between. We forget about all the issues of the day. We forget. We don't even care. They just shrink down. All of our problems, they don't even matter anymore. And we're not talking about denying where we are. What I'm talking about is that when we invite God into where we are, he fills us. He favors us. He moves us forward. He blesses us. He gives us position. He gives us rest. He gives us prosperity right where we are. Nothing else has to happen. All we need is him. He is the more. Ladies, there is more in the in-between for each of you.